Doodle and Chat. Hello, Mandy. Hello, Carrie. How are you? I'm good. It's been a minute. It has been a minute. It has. Yes. Last week, we decided to Doodle and Chat a song, our monthly song. So we weren't live. And then, so it's been a couple weeks. It has. You know what? Your doodle that you did with that new style nailed it. Also would like to point out that my doodle's not there yet, but it's coming. <laughs> what is so fun. I'm loving like, I'm. I, well, that was the second one I did. I'm so yes. obsessed with this whole music thing, like turning on the music, listening to it. You know, it's just really, really fun. And yeah, I tried to find, I've been trying to practice that style where you see people combining different black line images together over and over again. Um, it also reminds me, I can't remember of that artist name that would do like graffiti of people. Um, I can't remember what his name is, um, but it reminds me of that a little bit. Not that I'm close to that, but it does. <laughs> it does I well. love this style too. I might have to try it sometime. Um, yours turned out amazing though. Like I looked at that. I'm like, that is so cool. Thank you. And I'm also having fun with the music one because it's giving me... Um, permission to take notes with words in a different way. So I find that I'm more picture heavy with the music and then just picking up different lyrics. And so it's, I, I find okay. it to be an interesting flip of like, you know, usually we're so concept heavy, like get the words. So it's been a fun little shift. So yeah. Good. Fun, fun. It is fun. Tonight. We Tonight. Have, I know we have Valentina Gonzalez. I'm so excited. I am too. So let me share a little bit about Valentina. Um, she is an advocate for English learners. Um, she's currently an educational consultant and content creator helping teachers support English learners. So Valentina began her career in education as a third grade language arts teacher in Texas. Since then, she served in many capacities, including teaching second, third, fourth grades, ESL instruction support specialty teacher and ESL facilitator for campuses. She's a longtime educator of multilingual students from around the globe and uses her experiences as an immigrant and language learner herself from Yugoslavia to support these students. Valentina is the co-author of the book, Reading and Writing with English Learners, a framework for K-5. And I'm excited to doodle and chat and learn all about her tonight. I would also add that she is an avid sketch noter herself. So, so we, are, we are in fabulous company. Like, I'm so excited to not just talk to her and listen to her, but I'm also excited to just connect with her in that sense, too. So how cool. Let's get started. OK. Hi, everyone. Hey, hey, Mandy. Thank you so much for having me. You're, You're welcome. welcome. We're so excited. Now, we were talking before we went on air and you have a little bit of like, you know what you're getting into, but you're really just ready to just dive in and just have this doodle and chat experience with us. So we're so excited. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm really excited too. Like this is so fun, so innovative, so creative. So I'm I'm up for it. Thank you, thank you. And you told us you have your iPad ready, right? Yay. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And we have some friends here with us already. We have Nilan is here and Monica. So that will be fun. Um, if you're here with us live or if you're joining us later, um, we welcome you to put pen to paper and doodle along with us, whether it's your responses to um, the questions that we asked Valentina or Valentina's responses. We have our trusty bull that knows. Um, <laughs> we call it the bull that knows because it always seems to give us just the right question for our friends that, are, that we're with. It has some very special Valentina questions in here, as well as a few that Mandy and I don't even know what they are. So we're really, really excited to doodle and chat with you tonight. <laughs> I'm so, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> Those <laughs> questions <laughs> kind of have me a little nervous, but I'm also really excited. So yes. Okay. Let's get it started. You're going to be, you're gonna, you're gonna be fabulous. <laughs> All right. I'm going to turn on my camera and Mandy's and then we will get started. Oops. And our producer's late. I'm going to have to find her later. Um, <laughs> her boyfriend's here. So she's upstairs socializing. Yes. Yes. That's important. It is important to be social. I am aware of that. Yes. <laughs> and there's also a cat upstairs. So there's, you know, they, they like to socialize with the cat. Then the cat's cute. So, you know, it takes all the attention <laughs> that you get. 
totally get that. So I guess I'm in charge of the bowl right now. <laughs> it's been a while since I've been in charge of it. But you're a pro, you're a pro at it. So you've I got I am it. a pro at it. Thank you. All right, here we go. I like that you put the glasses on though. Good. Job. I can't see anymore without them. I know I'm going to go back to the optometrist this year and he's going to be like, are you ready for bifold to I, uh, contact yet, Carrie? <laughs> I don't know. I like the glasses, but then there's times in class where I don't want to put the glasses on and I'm like this, like that. <laughs> or I walk up to a kid and I'm like, can you turn the brightness up on that? Because I can't see. I know. I So many times when we're at dinner, I have to use the the flashlight on my phone to look at the menu. And it is, you know, it's embarrassing, but you have to do what you have to do. I know. So here we go. Okay. Thank you, Mandy, for pointing that out. I liked it. It's fine. I listen, I have monovision contacts once he's far away, once he's close up. So oh. that's, that's what I have. So I would need glasses too. It's fine. Well, Monica says she's at the trifocal. I don't even know what that is. What's a trifocal? I don't either, but I probably need that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. My, our future. Thank you, Monica. <laughs> oh, here we go. We have a random question to start us off. What movie best describes your life? Oh, my goodness. Wow, that is a really hard question. Oh my gosh. What movie? Or you could do multiple movies too. You have quite a faceted, you know, multifaceted life that you've lived so far. Wow. Do I get any passes? Like, is there any pass? <laughs> no, but we could start. I mean, we could just start talking about, you know, I mean, we, Manny and I, you know, know a little bit about Valentina. What movie? Man, movies are really hard for me. Um, are you not a movie person? I mean, I watch movies, but I'm, uh, I forget. Like, I forget movies really easy. So I forget the names of them. I forget the people. We'll watch movies and I'll go, Did I, have I watched this before? <laughs> yes, you've watched it before. Yes, you have watched it. Um, what if we did TV show or book? Because I know you also love reading books. I do love reading books. I have a lot of books. Um, what what book um, reminds me of my life? Well, because I immigrated here and um, when I was a child, um, I'm trying to think, is there even a movie that's similar that has not I'm sure there is a movie about immigration. Um, there's a children's book recently that uh, a couple of years ago I read that's called um, How Alma Got Her Name. I believe that that's How Alma Got Her Name. And um, when I read it, it reminds me of when I was in elementary school and when my parents told me about how I got my name. And that, that book kind of reminds me of my childhood. Not my whole life, not, not Valentina's whole life, but just just my name in itself. I'm sorry, I cannot think of a- That's okay. <laughs> That's okay, the book is great. Like Alma, Alma and how she got her name. I love it. So how did you get your name? Oh, thank you for asking that. My father actually named me. He gave me my name. He named me after the first female Russian cosmonaut. Wonderful. And it really is special to me because he he had high hopes for me, high aspirations. Um, the first female Russian cosmonaut paved the way for females, for women, and she did something amazing. And I think my father always had high hopes that I would do the same. And I mean, I'm not, you know, as fabulous as Valentina Tereshkova. <laughs> She's paved the way in a lot of um, amazing things for women. Um, but I do aspire to do great things. And hopefully in my life, I've done something that has made my dad proud of naming me that way. Oh, I love that story. Thank you.
I think my co- my cosmonaut helmet looks more like a deep sea diving helmet, but we're gonna let it go. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm having to let. I'm having like yeah. Oh, running. you did a rocket. That was a good idea. I immediately well, got helmet, and I was like, nope. <laughs> Well, I also was like, how can I make this more feminine? I guess I could, you know, color it pink. Um, or put I love the, it. I couldn't remember which symbol is the, the female symbol. Is it the one with the circle and the cross or the circle and the circle? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't even know. <laughs> I wasn't sure I wanted to include that either. So. I actually think it's really cool um, when people know what they're named after. Like, I, mm-hmm. I, like, I love to hear those stories. Mm-hmm. I think it, it's nice um, to find out. I mean, not everyone knows or right. um, has that kind of background. But when I think about, like, my son, there isn't really um, – we didn't name him after somebody in our family. We actually, like, we had a few names chosen for him. But when I told, like, when I told my mother-in-law, we think we want to name him Jaden. She was like, oh, no, don't name him that. And I was like, that's the name I'm naming him. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, everyone has a name story, but it's not always. <laughs> that's funny. Well, that first one was fun. That was fun. See, I love. So here's what the bullet knows. Like you started with that question and you're like, not really sure how to answer it. And we got a good story out of you that we didn't know. <laughs> I love it. The bullet does. does know after all. It does. <laughs> it does. It does. All right. Let's see what it has for us next. Okay. We've got a rocket ship and a helmet on our book. We've got a great little children's book. Yay. Okay. All right. You say on your website, I believe that all students bring assets and value to our classrooms and that every teacher is a teacher of language. What is the best way for educators to embrace these words? Oh, You know, I think that one of the best things we can do as educators is focus on children, focus on the children that we have in front of us and remember that that's why we do what we do. Um, If it weren't for the kids in our classrooms, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be there. We wouldn't have curriculum. We wouldn't have standards. We wouldn't have resources. And when we focus on the kids themselves, focus on getting to know them as individuals and really humanize the jobs that we do, then we're really gonna make the greatest impact. Those relationships we build with them and when when we know them, we we can bring out those assets in kids. I think that's where our power is as educators. We can be so powerful um, in our role as educators, when we focus on the kids in our classrooms, I love that. I do too. I love it. I went for binoculars and then I chickened out. <laughs> Or had, um, it I went for, I had the eyes really big in the middle of it. And then I was like, glasses, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I did the magnifying glass. I love it. Which was appropriate for the previous conversation because uh, I sometimes also might need a magnifying glass. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> that is so true. Mandy, we bought a, a magnifying glass that we keep on our um, our table in the living room. It used to be a decoration. That's what it was purchased for. <laughs> now it is functional in our house. Like we need it. I get it. I do. I get it. I love that though. <laughs> I love it. So true. I 
And I'm going to go back later and add in that quote because that, um, I love that quote. Absolutely. It is. It's really, it's really, uh, yeah, it's really fantastic. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to leave some room for the quote. Well, I think that's one of the things in getting to know at least Valentina from just, you know, the research I was, we were doing on her is I think one of that's, that's one of the approaches I think to working with students, um, whether you call them multilingual language or ML, right? Or EL, things change all the time. Um, I think that your, at least what my take was that I found was really powerful is just the, the reiteration of they're just not someone else's students, Absolutely. that they're all of our students and that we need to value that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, when we when we take kids and we put them in silos and we put ourselves in silos, then we're really doing a disservice to them. We're um, creating this disconnection between ourselves and the kids and the curriculum as well. And so when when we when we can make connections between um, the educators that work with all of the kids and uh, ensure that kids are not disconnecting when they go from this teacher to the next. Um, we're going to we're going to create conditions where kids really grow linguistically and academically. I don't want my kids to go, you know, oh, I'm going to the ESL teacher or I'm going to this teacher. So let me just, you know, disconnect from what I'm doing in this classroom and now I'll go do something totally different. We should, you know, collaborate and work together and ensure that we're all working to serve the children that are in front of us. And, and that collaboration is, um, is, can be so powerful for students. Agreed. Agreed. Here's mine so far. Okay, let me zoom in on you. Oh my gosh, look at that beautiful name. Oh, I love it. And you picked a magnifying glass. Oh, the moon is there. I love it. <laughs> I love that she put the children under the magnifying glass. Um, I started to do that. And much like your binoculars, I chickened out and I was like, I'm just going to write the word. <laughs> I'm so fascinated by y'all's work. It's so beautiful. <laughs> I think we think the same thing of your work too. Yes, absolutely. All right, let's see what is next for us. Well, I felt compelled to add hands because there's just this child-centered, you know, message that just oozes from That's Valentina good. and everything that she says. Love it. What is something that most educators often do not realize about being an immigrant to the United States? I think one of the hardest parts is that um, if you're not in a bilingual program and you're in an ESL program, sometimes the feeling that your first language um, is left out and lost and mm -hmm. ignored um, is not recognized by um, many educators. 
there's such a focus on English and acquiring English is important and we want students to do that, but we don't wanna leave out their first language that they came to us with. When we ignore it, when we don't recognize it or value it or help to bring it in and welcome it, sometimes the hidden message is that it's not valued, that it's not important. And over time, students lose their first language. And I, I think that's not talked about enough. I, I don't think a lot of people think about that because there is such a focus on acquiring English. And you're right. There is. I don't even, I, yeah, I find that even in my school. Yeah, you're right. That is the focus. Let's, yeah. how fast can we teach them to learn English and how fast can we get them integrated in and, and caught up, right? Yeah. Caught up, right, with everybody else. Um, yeah. It's tough. And, you know, I mean, that first language is a huge foundation to acquiring English, but we, we often like, we forget that that's important. We forget that they're, they're always using it in their mind, but if we don't tap into it as a resource, then um, we're not leveraging a huge asset that they already have. That, that is a very good way to say that. Um, I've always had a passion, I think because when our English learners started, um, like when they started growing in our district, I was one of the teachers that had a lot of them in class. And I saw a lot of the struggles that they would have. And we definitely just had an ESL program. Like that's that's more what it was. But I had a co-teacher in the classroom um, who was bilingual. However, she didn't speak all of the languages. Um, she just spoke the languages for some. And it was helpful, um, but I didn't completely understand you know, what their needs were because the program was so new, but we were always looking for ways to help them. And I don't feel like, you know, at the time that we did a really great job with it. And so it has always kind of been a passion of mine to make sure that we at least value the struggle that they have. So there's a really interesting clip um, and somebody shared it at a conference that I was at. And so I've also snagged it. So I share it too. And it's from the perspective of a little boy in the classroom and about how, and I'm sure you know which clip I'm talking about, and it's about how, um, like, he takes longer to process and he takes longer to do all of that, and the teacher automatically assumes it means he doesn't know the answer. Right. When And then in the, in the voiceover, it kind of emulates, like, how he's processing the information. It was very eye-opening for me just mm -hmm. to see that, to understand that they really do need extra time to process and a lot of times we don't understand that. Exactly. And the clip you're talking about, I believe it's the Moises video. He's um, in a math classroom. Yes, that's yeah. the one. Yes, I know exactly which one you're talking about. I think a lot of times, um, and I know I felt this way in, in a lot of different ways as an educator, um, sometimes our own inadequacies mm. um, with teaching students that either are English learners or they have certain needs that we are sh not sure how to serve. Our own inadequacies um, are reflected on the students in certain ways. And um, just, you know, figuring out how to serve students that have either are acquiring English or have um, different abilities. Um, if we figure find those professional development resources, if we find those um, techniques, then we can serve them in the ways that they need. Uh, because just like that video that you, you were talking about, that child, um, just like our students who are acquiring English, they can still think and feel and, and learn. We just have to figure out how to do that, you know, how, how to, design lessons that are accessible for them and help them to participate in the classroom. I think that's mm -hmm. the key here, um, especially when we're serving multilingual learners. And even the even the, the labels that we give them, 
mm-hmm. matter. You know, here we are talking about English learners. And so the stress is on English. The focus is on That's English. So but when I say multilingual learners, all of a sudden, mm-hmm. now, now we're talking about kids that know more than one language. Yep. And it's more of an assets-based approach to the same kids. Yep. Agreed. And when, I, I mean, it's honestly when we were doing research for you, because I hear English learners often, English as a second language learners. I mean, we, we get that label a lot. Um, I When I saw your multi-language learners, I was like, wow, that I really like that. And that's just not something that in our district we have used. No. Um, and I, I like that. Like yeah. I like how how that feels and how that sounds for the learners. Yeah, I agree. It's not very common. Uh, most states are still using the term English learners, and it's it's still very common. And I understand why. Um, mm-hmm. But many many people and 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 some states are moving towards the term multilingual learners, understanding that that, um, that terminology gives us more of a focus on what students are able to do. Yeah. We made this shift a couple, a year or two ago in my, in my district, at least to turn to as multi-language or ML learners versus EL. So that's also yeah really nice. And Monica reminds us assets versus deficits. It's always, you know, that's always a good, a, a better lens is asset, you know, asset based versus deficit based, you know, yeah, exactly. um, it reminds me a lot of a lot of the language that you use reminds me a lot of the language that I would use working with the students with disabilities that I, you know, I, I teach extended resource and, you know, presumed competency and things like that are all things are they're all good strategies for every learner, really. And I think yeah. that's one of the things that I really was um, impressed but also um just overwhelmed with is that just that message that yes they're multi-language learners but they're students and these these tools that you have for them are good for everybody they just make you a better teacher exactly exactly if we can just embrace that idea that we're creating accessibility for all of our learners and everyone will benefit um then then every child in our classroom is going to grow whether whether they're multilingual learners or they're children with different abilities or they're children that are receiving gifted services, what, wherever they are developmentally right. and cognitively, they're going to grow. They're going to make progress um, alongside our multilingual learners as well. Agreed. Agreed. And I would, I mean, I, we would, I think we all would argue or say too, is that those multi-language learners are only going to make everybody else in the classroom better as well. Because absolutely, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because um, of their experiences. Yeah, because of their experiences, and because the more language we know, the more the more ways we can say something, um, the broader our world is. Mm-hmm. The more we can communicate with people. Um, the broader our horizons are. If I can communicate with someone in Spanish or in French or in Arabic, um, I've I've opened up my world just a little bit more. And so uh, it doesn't hurt anyone to know words in other languages. (laughs) So that's a good thing, you know? And I, I, I think about classrooms where we have multilingual learners and people often say, well, how, how can our multilingual learners enrich other students? When we invite them to use their first languages in our classrooms and we're labeling the walls in, our, in students' first languages or we're inviting them to share how they say words in their languages, everyone is gaining new vocabulary. And Mm -hmm. in a global society, the global world that we live in today, that only benefits all of our students. I agree, I agree. So I, you know, I teach uh, extended resource, but I also have two children that um, were lucky enough to go through a dual language program since kindergarten. I know, um, and I, I can relate a lot with the language thing, but I think the most surprising thing for me as a parent wasn't just 
the power of building two languages in the classroom and what that does for the whole classroom. That was awe inspiring to see the foundation of both languages being, you know, solidified in that power, but also the cultural impacts that students have, that different experiences have on each other. Um, and I remember being a little bit nervous because it was a um, Spanish dual language. And I was just a little bit culturally just, you know, I will say that my whiteness shined, you know, I was worried about my, my two white children. Um, but in the end, the friendships that they had, the cultural that they learned and were exposed to, yeah, it was just, it made our family better and it made my children better. And it's, and some of their best friends are the ones from those classes. And I think that in, in addition to the language, the culture and the understanding of different people and the way they do things is really, really powerful. Yes, absolutely. The more we can learn about people who are different from ourselves, the better connections we have with each other. And I mean, you think about like, we may be very different, but I bet we're, we have a lot in common as well. And we build empathy with one another. And I, I don't know, but in today's society, the, the more we can do that, especially mm -hmm. at a young age with our kids, I think the better off we will be in the long run. I agree. So, I agree. Your kids are so lucky that they, they got to be in a program like that. I know after seeing it, and now both my kids are, um, I have a junior and a sophomore, and I'm certain that that foundation, building those, both those languages, you know, did special things to their brain, first of all. You know, I think that's also something we forget about our multi-language learners is that being a multi-language learner has exceptional benefits to students in their academic capacity, you know? Um, yes. So I know that that had an impact on if funny things like their math, you know, and their English skills, but like their reading and writing skills, but math, I feel like, you know, it really impacted that. Um, but it also makes me sad that our country hasn't embraced that more because now we have a class, we know we have a, a program that's research-based that has the capabilities of students never losing their home language. Right. And, you know, and really foundation, because that's what like in an extent in, in special eds, oftentimes we'll get students where their their original, you know, their native language was never built. Mm -hmm. So you're always fighting that. And now we have a program that we know builds it and the second language. So anyways, I, I could go on and on. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, but it's just, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so Fox. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I'm with you on that. Um, absolutely. Most of the world is a multilingual and mm -hmm. So um, creating those experiences where our brain can develop and grow and become stronger in so many ways. Um, I read somewhere recently that being monolingual is a disadvantage. <laughs> and so, you know, the more we can grow our students to be bilingual or multilingual, we're giving them advantages. Yeah. Okay. So, socially and economically in their future and 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 in so many ways cognitively um so many different ways absolutely yeah for sure what's something else that means power that's not a muscle I keep drawing muscles and I'm tired of that. And they, I still am terrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> what else is power? That means power. Yeah, like so I think of like the little power up things on video games because I'm a video game person. So when that I is, is that a question mark on it? Yeah. Oh, I like that. Okay. Little power ups. Yep. Yes. Little, little Mario power ups. Yes. My cat has come to visit, but now he's, now he's leaving. <laughs> he made a quick appearance. <laughs> and he's like, okay, now I'm leaving. I'm done with you. <laughs> Cats can be fickle. That's true. No, I think I'll stick with the muscle next time. <laughs> I need it. That looks like a power-up box. It does. I'm not crazy about it. 
but I think I'll stick with the muscle next time. I'll just keep working on my muscles. <laughs> I was thinking a battery. Yes, oh, that's good too. I like that better. I like batteries. Yes. Yes. All right. Our, our producer was late, but she's here now. I think we're ready for another question. Oh, Hello, yeah. producer. Hello. What are a few of your fondest memories from your time in your second, third, and fourth grade classes in Katy, Texas? Oh, I loved being in the classroom. Uh, I think some of my fondest memories, uh, well, I love reading aloud to students. Mm -hmm. That is my favorite thing in the world to do when I'm in the classroom, reading aloud, just I'm super animated when I read to students. Uh, I love engaging with them and I read aloud. So definitely reading aloud to kids is a big fond memory. Um, when I think back on my memories with my students in the classroom in second, third, and fourth grade, I think my fondest memories are like, I picture specifically one, one of my students coming to me day after day. And she was a first year newcomer student. And every day she would come to me and ask me for another book to read. And I mean, she was devouring books. Again, this is books. I don't know why my fondest memories are always with books, but she would devour books. And every day I would have to find a new book for her to read. That child is now in college. We still keep in touch. Aww. I talked to her um, about a month ago. I, I was talking to her, asking her about her experiences and what she remembers from when she first came to America. And she told me that um, she can't believe that 10 years ago, she couldn't speak English. She wasn't reading in English yet. And now she is majoring in journalism where she only reads and writes in English fully proficiently and she still speaks Spanish, but it's just fascinating to me um, how brilliant our students are. Brilliant. She was an avid reader, and I, I attribute her growth to the massive amounts of reading she was doing. I couldn't keep up with her. Like she wanted, she wanted a book every single day. <laughs> it was so hard for me to keep finding books for her. Um, Love it. Another fond memory. Oh, at Christmas time, you know, this the students always want to give the teacher a gift, and I had this one student. He. He didn't have a gift for me and I could tell that he wanted to give me a gift so bad. And he went and got a book off my bookshelf because he knew I loved books. And he, he took it out in the hall. He wrapped it in a paper, um, in paper towels and he brought it to me and gifted it to me. Mrs. Gonzalez, I brought you a Christmas gift and I just, I pretended like it was an amazing gift. Thank you so much. I love it. This is my favorite. He just wanted to be like the other kids giving me a gift. And I'll never forget that because, you know, he didn't, he didn't have, he didn't have the funds or the family that could give a gift, but he wanted to. And I just will never forget that. I but, love that. I know. So I know. <laughs> They're so precious. Their kids are so precious, and they just want to—they just want to be 
um, included. They do. They do. And I think it was probably a blog post that you wrote and you talk about how important language, that kind of language is when we're talking to students, instead of saying things like, um, who's been to the zoo, you know, asking more inclusive questions when it comes to, ask, you know, um, not like, what have you, what did you do over Christmas break or, you know, making yeah. sure that everybody's where everybody's at, whether it's economically or experience wise, that we're making sure we're respecting that and asking questions in a way that nobody's ever going to feel like their life is is less valuable because they haven't had the same experiences. And I think that's important. And that's exactly what you did with that gift. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah, that, that is true. And there were times, I mean, I have to be honest with you, there were times in my career where I failed in those circumstances. And I think that's how I learned is I would ask a question and have kids who didn't have those experiences. And then you realize, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. I phrased that completely wrong. I should have said it this way, or I made an assumption that I shouldn't have made. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you learn um, through those mistakes or you learn from um, mistakes that were made on yourself, <laughs> but um, we, we grow through those, those experiences, but definitely um, uh, I think the holidays are probably the most obvious ones that not everyone celebrates the same holidays and has the same experiences. The the zoo thing um, was something I actually learned from one of my own family members um, because we would take our we would take our own kids. Uh, I have a daughter and a son, and we would take our kids to the zoo pretty regularly. And I have a niece who um, one day when she was quite older, she's the same age as my daughter. One day she, she told me I've never been to the zoo. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was stunned. My, someone in my own family had never been to the zoo. And, you know, even in your own, your own family members have different circumstances. They have different lives. They, they don't have the same experiences that we may have. And it was just an aha moment in my life where I was like, whoo, I need to stop and think about how, how I ask questions and the way I phrase things. Yeah. Life and people that come into our lives, I feel like it's really special when we have, when we can take a moment to pay attention to the, to the things that they can teach us, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a good point, Carrie. And um, it's, um, it's what our students teach us uh, that we learn, like we learn so much more from them mm -hmm. than they learn from us. I think that's a, a huge point to make, especially um, I felt like from my multilingual learners and their families, I learned so much more from them than they probably learned from me <laughs> over the times that I spent with them. And, uh, you know, my, myself being, um, I was an English learner myself and my family, we, we came here as immigrants. We didn't speak English. That didn't mean that when I started teaching that I magically knew how to serve mm. learners. It didn't mean that I magically had the strategies in my tool belt. I, I truly could empathize with many of them. I un maybe understood what they were going through in a lot of ways, but I didn't naturally have the tools in my tool belt to, to teach them everything they needed to know. I still had a lot of growth. I still needed to go to a lot of professional development and it, it was a process for me, even being an English learner myself. That's a wonderful point. That's yeah. We're all we all still need have yeah things to learn. Um, Nilan did did wonder if you encourage pull out or a more integrated approach to instruction. This may be a long answer, but if maybe if you have a short, do you have is is it do you have an answer for that? Oh uh, well, short and long answer. I do encourage students to have um, an English development block. English language development block of time. That doesn't necessarily have to be pull out. 
for newcomer students that are at very early levels of English development, um, pr English proficiency, you may need to pull them out, but not for an extended amount of time, not for, um, not for hours at a time and not for an entire year. Um, keeping a, a good pulse on where they are on their English proficiency um, and then gauging, like, are they ready to transition into um, a push-in or content-based model where we can co-teach or be in, be in the classroom more integrated, um, least restrictive environment for our multilingual learners where they are with their peers and learning content with the language infused in is best for them. So um, pull out as least as possible, um, keeping in mind that newcomers at the at the earliest levels of English proficiency may need some pull out mm -hmm. instruction, but not for a long time. Makes sense. Thank you. I, I do believe in co-teaching. I do believe in having students in the classroom with their peers, learning content and language simultaneously. That's the best for our students. But it means that all teachers have to understand how to shelter instruction and serve students that are acquiring English and learning content. That makes sense. And I think that goes back to even the first the first answer that you, or the second one of when we said focus on the kids. You, you, you talked about building relationships with students, but you also ended with the fact that collaboration is essential and our peers that we work with are a key also to to making this work yeah it's it's i heard someone once say well you know um we have to they have to they have to go out of the classroom and learn how to speak english first and and then they can come learn the content but that's just not the way it works that that is that may seem easy that may seem like it'll work but that isn't that does not work for, for our learners. Socially, emotionally, cognitively, it's, that does not do the trick. Um, all of us need to know how to serve our English learners in our classrooms um, collaboratively. And um, that approach is going, it means that we, we all need the professional development. We all need to have the support and resources to serve students in our classrooms. I love that. Agreed, 100%. Are you ready for another question? Okay. Valentina's brain is going overdrive today. I know. I haven't been drawing much. Okay. You're doing wonderful. I love I'm loving this conversation. I'm just soaking you all in. Okay. So am I. So am I. We got a really random question. Okay. What is one of your favorite smells? Oh. Oh, I kind of like that question. I do like the smell of rose and lavender too. Mm -hmm. I like rose, like sometimes I'll spray rose spray on myself um, before I put any makeup on. So I, I think I like rose the best of all. Um, lavender is also pretty. Yeah, rose and lavender. I like this. But I'm, and I'll tell you something while you're kind of drawing that out, but um, when I was in college, I worked as a, a fragrance, you know, one of those people then people that spray fragrance and try to make you buy it. That's <laughs> yes. what I did to, you know, get myself through college. And so um, fragrances are really either annoying to me or I love them. Gotcha. Because of that, because I sprayed so much fragrance. <laughs> Lavender looks like corn. That's okay. My lavender looks like wheat, so we're there. <laughs> <laughs> well, when I tried to draw a rose, that was just a mistake. Well, you know, the center of my rose turned out okay, and then I decided to do something with it, and now it looks like some, like, 
alien flower. I'm not really sure, but <laughs> my rose looks like a succulent. So you like know. the center of the rose. Like if I had just stuck with the center of the rose, it would have been fine. <laughs> But that's okay. Yeah, my lavender looks. Oh, like you have a nose. That was clever. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I like that. know how to draw lavender i need to see your lavender it's like the stem and then it has like little like i don't know petals it's like a lot of petals right lavender mm -hmm. is purple and it has it's like bushy okay is it like a blue bonnet do you know what a blue bonnet looks it's like smaller so lavender is smaller <laughs> and so i mean i'm not far off with the wheat it just needs to be a little bit more in there so yeah. like it's almost okay. like a skinny cattail that has like little little balls of stuff on it instead of like little spiky things. Okay. Okay. It's like a big puff. The definition, I guess. I don't know. Okay. Color it purple and write lavender next to it. And everybody <laughs> will say, oh my gosh, you draw the best lavender, Valentina. <laughs> it looks just like lavender. Okay. We have time for one more question. And I have space for one more question. Perfect. What would be your first question after waking up from being cryogenically frozen for 100 years? <laughs> Okay. For 100 years, I've been cryogenically frozen. What will I ask? Yes. Okay. I will ask. Well, I'm not going to ask who's president because <laughs> if it's been 100 years, I won't even know. <laughs> if they tell me the name. I won't even know. So um, I will ask someone to bring me some coffee because I, and when I wake up, the first thing I want is coffee. Yes. And I am lucky enough that every morning my husband brings me coffee. Oh. He is the sweetest. That is sweet. So I'm going to ask for my coffee. And then after coffee, then we'll get down to business. But coffee first. If I've been cryogenically frozen for that long, I will need coffee. And how will your coffee be? Um, how will you take your coffee? I will take my coffee iced with caramel. It's iced coffee with caramel. And I just made it hot, hot coffee. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to just take the steam off of it. <laughs> Is that how you order it? Like you just you just say, I want iced coffee with like caramel in it? Is that how you order it? Well, I mean, my husband makes it at home. Well, so it. Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Um, if I no, go to like it. Starbucks, I'll order an iced caramel macchiato. But I don't go there very often anymore because I don't. I, I like to make it at home. I just have one coffee every morning and that's all. Okay. Well, no, I can't relate on that level, but <laughs> I am with you with the coffee. So. <laughs> I do have more coffee than a person should have. Just going to be honest. <laughs> that's okay. I think we can still squeeze in one more question. Perfect. Since the bowl's making them so short. <laughs> what is a food, a memory, and a celebration you cherish from your childhood? So 
A food, what is it? A food? We say food, or. Memory. I said and. I know. We'll just say or. or. Yeah. A celebration. What's a food, memory, or celebration you cherish from your childhood? Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, we used to go camping all the time. Really? And it was like legit camping, real camping, camping. So, and we didn't take vacations. Um, we didn't like travel. So camping was the thing. We we would tent camp, like um, sleeping on the floor, fishing. My dad loved to fish, so I would fish with him. We caught big fish. I mean, it was a ton of fun, a big deal. And I have pictures of us, you know, camping and fishing, and I love that memory. And even now, as adults, we still do the camping, but we, we do cabin camping now. <laughs> My you know, family is also big campers. What? And let me just tell you what I'm not is a big camper. Um, <laughs> I am not about bugs. I am not about sleeping on the ground and I mean, we didn't take a lot of vacations either. And so my family would choose to go camping. And so I just remember every time they're like, so we're going to go take a trip. And I was like, oh, man, it's camping. <laughs> we were just laughing at it's Max, right? That's Max. Yes. Kale is, is, is cracking Annabeth up. I've never drawn a tent before. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little bit of an acquired. So it, you want to start like with a triangle and then you want to start down a little bit and then do a spread. Okay. And then if there's room, you can put a pole in the middle. Okay. Well, and I did mine kind of from the side. So there you go. Carrie, did y'all go camping when you were a kid? Was that a thing? We did a lot. We would do, yeah, we did a lot of like, like what you talked about camping. And so um, we had our favorite spots um, that, that we would go to. We had some in Wisconsin that we would go to. And then like we had, I remember we had a couple big trips out to Yellowstone and we would every other day, right? So one day was camping and the next day was a hotel. I have some like really funny camping stories from, uh, from those trips, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah, fondest memories of camping. I it's I don't enjoy it as much as I used to. Like for nowadays, if I was gonna go camping, it'd be like October, so there's no mosquitoes. Because there's nothing worse than being sweaty with mosquitoes and lots of bug spray. Yeah. And then going to take a shower, no matter how nice the campsite is, with mosquitoes in the shower place. It's just it's just gross, right? Right. So you walk out of the shower and you have to spray yourself with bug spray. <laughs> exactly. But I do, I have very fond memories of camping and I, and I relatively enjoy it, but yeah, there's a lot of great cabin camping you can do nowadays, which makes I it more relatively fun. enjoy it. <laughs> As a kid, it's just so fun. Camping's like, you know, it's just an adventure. <laughs> Mindy's just such a disagreement. <laughs> Does it like the time the raccoon stole the... Listen, you're laying in that tent. And so first of all, like if you don't unzip it and zip it fast, those mosquitoes are in there with you. Yeah. And then you can hear things clicking outside your little, you know, and I was like, what is that noise? And she's like, well, like, it's probably an armadillo. I'm like, I don't even know what that is. And that's not okay. So like, you can hear the little nails on the ground. I was like, I will not have to go to the bathroom all night. <laughs> you have to leave the tent to go. So I... I just was not about it. <laughs> we have some pretty good stories of raccoons when we've left like one, just one too many things out. Yep. And they, and then one time my sister brought um, their dog camping mm. and rac and a mama raccoon with her babies decided to come into our tent or not in our tent into our area. Uh -huh. That was, we didn't sleep that night. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I know. The raccoons and the 
armadillos, but all of that's just part of the fun. <laughs> it, is. it is. It is. Yeah. Just I'm, with like the I'm with Monica. I am, I would consider myself a glamper. Um, and I would actually love to buy one of those campers and fix it up and make it really nice. Like I would travel in a glamper, especially if I didn't have to leave the camper to use the facilities. <laughs> 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 And I would like for it to have an air conditioner. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. That's so funny. So funny. Now you're, you're bringing up all kinds of memories of camping for me. Um, Valentina. Yeah. We had, we had, we had really good times. Like I'll never forget singing the Milky way on the way to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I almost fell off the road, but I got to see the Milky Way, which was amazing. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, there's some fun things with those kind of experiences. Yes. I remember sitting outside on the, on the uh, lawn chairs and watching um, the, the stars, stars falling. Like, um, what is that called? When the stars fall? <laughs> Shooting star. <laughs> Shooting stars. Like it was a, one of those nights where there were lots of them, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. we have that here in Texas anyway. Every once in a while, there would be like a, a night where you could see a lot of shooting stars in the in the night sky. Yeah, yeah. So fun. Well, Valentina, do we get to see your, we'll show mine and then we'll have Annabelle show mine and then Mandy's and then we'll show yours. If you want to put, can you just, um, actually, Val Valentina's ready. Can we show Valentina's? Okay. And colors. I'm impressed. Oh my goodness. Look at your rose. And look at her tent. I know. And oh, and her iced coffee so good too. <laughs> oh, oh, I love it, Valentina. And I love the different colors for multilingual. That just makes my heart happy. Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. I do need to work on it a little bit more. <laughs> You're welcome too. Go ahead and we'll show Mandy's. Yes, let me see. Oh my gosh, that's it's got a little glare going on on my. There we go. Oh, I love your hands with the embrace differences. Yeah, oh, too. I love that. And the gift I bought, I brought you a gift. Aww. And I put little dotted lines on it because you said he wrapped it in um, paper towels. He so did. Yes. Little dots on it for the paper that towels is clever. Oh, I love it. Oh, and life take one. I love that. <laughs> 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 That's awesome. <laughs> oh, I love this. That's so okay. cool. Thank you. Oh. Wow. It's so neat to see everybody's different styles and the icons that we use. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is yes. fun. It's it's fun. We can take off the drawings now. Oh, that was interesting. <laughs> Where did yours go? I didn't get to see all of it. Oh, I'll take a picture, I'll take a picture of it and share okay. it on Twitter for you. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight with Doodle and Chat with friends, and it was wonderful to to talk to you and connect with you more. Um, it was just a wonderful way to spend an hour tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy and Carrie. I love Thank joining you. you and talking and chatting. <laughs> These questions were really very interesting. Sorry <laughs> if I didn't answer. <laughs> you did wonderful. You did. The, jar, the jar is lots of fun. <laughs> it is. We love it. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Valentina. Thank you so much to Doodle and Chat friends who joined us here or joining us later. If you were here with us, be sure to snap a picture of your Doodle and Chat and share it out on Twitter with hashtag Doodle and Chat so we all can see all the fun that you had with us here tonight on Doodle and Chat with friends. And then we will see everybody back here next Wednesday night for it'll be May for our May. I know, May. Wow. So that means it's time for our May Doodle and Chat classy act one pager activity where we share activities that teachers can bring right to the classroom and they can also join us here live as we experience them. So 
Um, we'll see everybody here next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Have a great weekend or weekday. Wait, week. <laughs> Bye. Bye, friends. <laughs>